really, really likes me. Oh my god, yes. Very oh. <laughs> I love, I love you. you. I love you. I love you. You do such a great everything. <laughs> <laughs> what you just watched was a completely platonic act of friendship between a gay man and a straight woman. Netflix's The Prom is one of the worst movies I've ever seen called Netflix's The Prom, and it's also one of the worst movies I've ever seen just in general. I will now tell you why. This story stars James Corden. Meryl Streep, Andrew Rannells, and Nicole Kidman as four washed-up Broadway actors who, in search of good PR, head to a small town in Indiana to support a young lesbian girl named Emma who's been banned from attending the school's prom in a campaign spearheaded by the homophobic, God-loving American PTA leader Mrs. Green whose daughter Alyssa is actually Emma's closeted partner. Along the way, the Broadway actors overcome their egos, fall in love, and confront personal demons. If you've seen, like, media before, you would probably expect the story's focus to be on the almost Romeo and Juliet type of love story, where Emma's main aggressor is her lover's mother. And if you watch the trailers for this movie, you would definitely expect that. Hello, Interweb. My name is Emma Nolan, and I'm 17. You might have heard about the prom in Indiana. I just want to go to prom like any other kid. All opposed. I know we all have stories to tell, and here's mine. But the prom is a bit quirky. It's a bit quirky at night. And the main characters are these four obnoxious, unlikable cartoon characters. Emma and Alyssa are barely afterthoughts in this movie. Alyssa's mom and the school principal are smiling and laughing with the Broadway actors on the poster, while Emma and Alyssa aren't even on it. And what's bizarre is that all of these flaws carry over from the original Atlanta and Broadway stage productions. Shockingly little is different between the two. No songs are cut, no scenes are rearranged. Normally, Hollywood takes really good Broadway musicals and completely breaks them. This time, Hollywood took a really flawed musical and did nothing to fix it, while breaking it a lot more. Tonight. A song about Jesus cures all homophobia in Indiana, a 16-year-old lesbian asks 40-year-old James Corden to be her prom date, and a celebrity grooms a fan who's 20 years younger than her and obsessed with her to further her agenda. Let's dive in. We open briefly on a PTA meeting, where Principal Hawkins is powerless against the volunteer PTA, who simply decide to cancel prom altogether to avoid the repercussions that would come from banning Emma Nolan. I'm not gonna question the power hierarchy in this school district, but that seems like a powerful PTA. Emma is sad. Across the country, the Broadway musical Eleanor! Exclamation point, the Eleanor Roosevelt musical celebrates its opening night. The show stars Dee Dee Allen and Barry Glickman, two raging narcissists. There is no difference between the President of the United States and a celebrity. We both have power. The power to change the world. It's a weighty responsibility. We're treated to an opening number about their love of the stage and of attention. I'll come out up front and say that the music in this show is really, really good. All of the songs out of context are incredibly catchy, and I think that every song here sounds better than in the original stage musical. The choreography is great, and a lot of it's lifted directly from the Broadway show, which we love to see. Everything's colorful and full of life. If you're into this sort of thing, just watch and listen to the songs on their own, because they're really the only thing of value here. But the issue is that they just don't fit together in the broader narrative. Returning to said narrative, Bertram from Jesse comes to inform the gang that Eleanor is getting blasted by terrible reviews, and this, combined with poor advanced sales, means Eleanor is closing after opening night, with most of the criticism directed at Dee Dee and Barry specifically. Watching Dee Dee Allen's Eleanor Roosevelt croaking out a heavy-handed message of activism is like paying an aging drag queen to shove a syrup-soaked American flag down my throat. <laughs> Depressed and dejected, the two accept drinks from former actor, now bartender, Trent Oliver. 
Stuck-up actor Angie Dickinson joins in the sorrow, having just quit the ensemble of Chicago when she was passed up for the role of its protagonist. The group, looking for a way to revitalize their careers and reputations, decide to become activists. We can still love ourselves, yet appear to be decent human beings. Everybody think of some causes, go. Uh, poverty? Too big. World hunger. Mm -hmm. Well, that is also a major thing. No, we need something we can handle. Recycling. Recycling Let's see what's skill. trending. Like, why are there so many award shows? Parking. Angie sees Emma trending on Twitter, and the group decides to drive to Indiana. They sing another number about their plans to do so. Finally, we get to spend more than one minute with Emma. We almost get four. She's mocked and scolded by cheerleaders Kaylee and Shelby for getting the prom canceled. And then we're clued into who Emma's actual lover is, Alyssa, Miss Green's daughter. Emma walks the halls at school singing about her situation. Note to self, don't be gay in Indiana. A weird issue with this song is that nothing she's doing tells us anything about her. She spends a portion of it swimming. Swimming's not a part of her character at all. It's like the cast and crew saw there was a pool at the school they were filming at, and were like, ooh, let's use that! She's clearly not singing during the portions where she's fully submerged underwater, I'd like to point that out. Not everyone is that repressed. Joe Ellen Pellman should have committed. I didn't know we had more than one lesbo in town. Well, you don't know her. She's new here. Like, an exchange student? Maybe. Mm. Well, then why don't you, like, exchange her for a guy? Why don't you, like, exchange her for a guy? Note to self, people suck in Indiana. <laughs> her personal introductory number just has her doing generic things and walking around, because outside of being kind and lesbian, Emma has very little personality. The reason that she doesn't have character-specific actions is because she is just lesbian slash girl. She was a more fleshed out character on stage. Little nervous mannerisms and shyness made her feel believable and real, and none of that really translated to the movie. There's also a part of the song where they're playing dodgeball and all the bullies are throwing the balls in slow motion and she's getting hit, but then she gets this burst of confidence and she starts throwing the balls fervently. It's so goofy, bro. I cannot take it seriously. The song's about a minute longer in the play, where she meets up with Alyssa and has a run-in with Miss Green. But the movie has to rush to the next James Corden scene, so they cut that part out. She glumly sits in class, where two dozen 26-year-olds throw paper at each other. Something that no version of this story bothers explaining is how the whole school knows that Emma is going with the girl to the prom if they don't know who the other girl is. Did Emma just go around telling people, I asked a girl to the prom? because that really doesn't seem within her character because she's posed as shy and very aware of Indiana's homophobic nature. This is never answered, but it seems like the entire story is built on a leap in logic. We then get to spend twice as much time with the actors on the bus. We learn that Dee Dee wants to win a third Tony Award, while Barry would just be happy winning one. That's the scene. This scene, which wasn't in the play at all, is so irrelevant that it's not even acknowledged in the Wikipedia summary. But they paid James Corden and Meryl Streep to be here, damn it, so they gotta expand their roles. After the state attorney deems this to be a civil rights issue, another school board meeting happens, and the most painfully realistic scene of all time occurs. That's what they feel best reflects America's values. Well, this isn't America, this is Indiana. It reminds me of those city hall meetings that went viral early in the pandemic, where we realized just how stupid Americans were. You literally cannot mandate somebody to wear a mask knowing that that mask is killing people. It literally is killing people. All of you are practicing the devil's law. It's about big government taking away our freedom of choice. And you? Doctor are going to be arrested for crimes against humanity. Suddenly, the Broadway stars burst onto the scene. Dee Dee sings a song in protest, but basically makes it clear that she has no clue what she's protesting. It's about poor Emma. 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 Can't you see the raw deal she's been dealt? Stealing the rights of a girl who is an LGBTQ teen. I've been far too angry to Google what those letters mean. 
Principal Hawkins is too start-struck by Dee Dee to kick her out and stop her number. The PTA disbands in utter confusion, and Principal Hawkins confesses that he is a massive fan of Dee Dee. Street people like Broadway too. <laughs> I've heard that. Her song in there was so emblematic of this story as a whole. Four smudgy Broadway stars insert themselves into the plight of a teenage girl who's had the world turn against her. We have come to show this community that gay people and gay positive icons such as myself are made of the same flesh and blood as they are. But the movie doesn't seem to understand what they're doing is wrong. They are front and center the whole time. Who are you people? We are liberals from Broadway. Oh, shut up. Who are you people? We are liberal Democrats from Broadway. <laughs> Emma has only appeared to sing songs, while all of the talking scenes have gone to the Broadway people. Currently, we are 29 minutes into the movie. Emma has been on screen for six minutes. Alyssa has been on screen for two minutes. It's Emma's story, damn it! As someone who did four years of high school theater in Oregon, I was not surrounded by straight people. I watched a ton of my friends come out, one after another, after another, after another. This movie baited people like that into watching it, but had no interest in telling an actually meaningful story for a Legitimacqua Plus people. Originally, I had a long segment of the video that was a passionate homophobia is bad speech, but I get the feeling that my audience kind of gets the idea by now is probably not necessary, and if they don't get the idea, they probably don't need a straight white 20 year old guy to preach it to them. I do not want to be one of the people that Bill Burr makes fun of in his stand up routines. Stupid ass woke white people. Oh my god, did you see what John Wayne said in Playboy in 1971? <laughs> Can you? This is a bunch of fucking white people. All up in arms about a dead white guy. I guess my main point here is that there's so few mainstream stories about coming out, and the prom pretended like it was going to be one. But the story starts and Emma's already come out a year and a half ago, they don't want to bother with that. And then Alyssa coming out is barely the C-plot here. In the play, Emma complains that the Broadway stars have ruined everything and are making her life an absolute nightmare. Stop taking my picture! We need a poster for the rally! Try to look helpless and afraid. Ooh, that's it. <laughs> Who are these people? A actors. Famous actors. They've come to help you. Well, they're not helping me. This is a nightmare. That's not in the movie. She finds them glamorous and awesome right off the bat in the film, and her opinion never changes. We're gonna help that little lesbian. Whether she likes it or not. I read three quarters of a news story and knew I had to come. Emma and Alyssa meet up and discuss how bizarre the PTA performance was and make plans for Alyssa to come out to her mom and the world soon. Singing a duet in the process, spinning around like no human has ever actually done in real life before. Alyssa was originally going to be played by Ariana Grande when the movie was announced, but she had to drop out due to scheduling conflicts, and they replaced her with another actress named Ariana, likely hoping no one would notice. This Ariana played the bullet in Hamilton, which is iconic. This Ariana played Anita in Spielberg's West Side Story, which is iconic. This Ariana will play Calypso in the upcoming Sony Craven the Hunter solo movie. Not iconic. Joe Ellen Pellman had not been in anything before or anything since. Emma and Alyssa almost kiss, but they don't, because Netflix is merely a gay, gay positive, positive icon. icon. Netflix itself isn't gay. That'd be too much for Act 1. Note to self, don't be gay. Back to the important characters, they check into a hotel and tread some of the most tired jokes of all time about how they've never heard of a hotel without a spa. Trent writes an acceptance song and Bertram arranges for the gang to perform it during the halftime show of a monster truck rally. Ladies and gentlemen, Truckosaurus, the car-eating robot dinosaur, will not be your halftime entertainment today. Big trees, not big of me. And it's not big of you. They're booed off the stage. It's like the demolition derby scene from Herbie the Love Bug 5 starring Lindsay Lohan. The only difference is that they have nothing in common and aren't similar at all. Come on, Herbie, I can't lose you, we're a team! I'll give the movie credit here because it cuts the song after one minute. We fully get the idea here. It did not need to be four minutes like it was in the stage version. <laughs> Here 
After their pathetic performance, Principal Hawkins and Emma come to visit the actors in the lobby of their hotel. Why'd he bring Emma to talk to four strangers they don't even know who interrupted a school board meeting? I don't know. How'd they know where to find them? I don't know. We never find out. But we find out that the Indiana Supreme Court ruled off screen that Emma must attend the school's prom. And it must be held. An exciting victory. Barry insists that he wants to help dress Emma for the prom. And Emma's like, okay, stranger, go ahead. Principal Hawkins invites Meryl Streep out to dinner. LOL, she's so rich that she's never heard of Applebee's. So funny, so silly. <laughs> there is a massive timeline issue here, and it's in the play too. We cut from the monster truck rally to them, pathetic, defeated in the hotel. It seems as though this is immediately after. <laughs> And the movie is not clear when this scene takes place because it's nighttime outside the window behind Trent, but daytime outside all of the other windows, which are also behind Trent. But whatever, it's either the night of or the morning after. Dee Dee says to take her out to eat right now. Take me now to this apples and bees place. <laughs> <laughs> then there's a scene at school in the middle of the day, and then at night they're at the restaurant, which means that it took the entire eight hour day for Dee Dee and Principal Hawkins to get to Applebee's. We wanted to make it special. Oh my God. Oh, it's so we brought Applebee's to feed you. I love Applebee's. Applebee's is by far my favorite like sit down restaurant. Oh my God, yes. He is like obsessed with her, her biggest fan. Single? Sorry? I'm single, just putting that out there. Really? <laughs> he sings a song about how he loves her, and her shows help him escape from his miserable job. The whole restaurant goes dark like that one Hannah Montana episode where she sees the guy on the beach. Remember that one? Good one, probably. I don't remember. I haven't seen it in 15 years. Hi. From the soul crushing jobs and emasculating pay. Emasculating pay. What does it even mean? Oh, I didn't make six figures this year. I feel like a woman. Dee Dee accepts and absorbs the constant praise from him because she's a narcissist. The next day at school, everyone's free to propose because prom is back on. Nick and Kevin, who had the banger line about exchange students earlier, ask out Shelby and Kaylee. And then for just a smidgen, Emma and Alyssa get to sing about what they mean to each other as well. The show opened at Alliance Theater in 2016, went to Broadway in 2018, and got a movie in 2020. That is a very fast pace. In the 2018 Broadway version of the soundtrack, the song's about an extra minute, where Alyssa and Emma continue to sing to each other. It's in the 2020 movie's soundtrack, they just cut it from the movie. But in the original 2016 version, the entire three minute song is solely between Emma and Alyssa. There's a scene where they meet up in the band closet and comment on how much they mean to each other and what specifically they like about each other. Is my favorite scene in the play because it actually makes them believable as a couple. They have genuine, nervous, youthful chemistry that the polished movie just lacks. What was the prom with me? <laughs> I already said yes. Well, this is a new legally mandated prom. <laughs> <laughs> you are so amazing. Am I? Yeah. I fell for you in like 10 seconds. When? You know! Tell me again. Okay. <laughs> when you played Imagine on the guitar for Thanksgiving assembly. I was so bad. You were awesomely bad. <laughs> I went out of my mind watching you trying to make peanut brittle in chemistry class. Emma, I blew it up. You blew up peanut brittle. It was incredible. <laughs> oh my gosh. You are. Like, I guess it's kind of cringe, but it's believable as actual nervous high school students. Ariana DeBose is clearly a confident woman and that carries over into Alyssa, assured and confident in every situation. Come on guys, lay off her. Oh, are you on her side now? <laughs> no, I'm just not in third grade. See you at practice. Then she just kind of tells us, oh, I'm nervous. And I don't really buy it the way I do in the stage show. Also, she is clearly in her late 20s. She was 28 when they filmed this. I had like five minutes before practice. 
Five is fine with me. Everything will change. No more waiting for the lights to go out before we sit together at the movies. No more fake guy days. Having them secretly meet in a band closet just feels so real. I had romantic moments in the band closet. That's the entire reason high schools have band closets. I guess this moment was cut when the show made the jump to Broadway, because the whole point of Broadway is to make shows worse than they were originally. The movie could have added this back. The one minute beginning scene with a PTA meeting was in the Atlanta version, cut from Broadway, and added back for the movie. It's an absolute crime. They cut the scene that makes the main relationship work, but added the scene where Barry and Dee Dee talk on a bus for three minutes, where we learn about how many rewards they have, despite the fact that we relearn the same information when they're trying to check into the hotel, making the bus scene redundant. In the words of this epic YouTube comment, even though this song is overflowing with... cliché, it's still a fucking bop. Kaylee and Shelby overhear Emma and Alyssa, and now they know the truth. Uh-oh. Oh no. Ah! Them finding out was only added in the Broadway version, and it has dumb, weird repercussions that I don't like, which I'll talk about later once they come up. Barry goes to Emma's house. She's living with her based grandma, who accepts Emma in spite of her parents not. She wasn't in the musical at all, just mentioned a few times. Granny gets to share her feelings on Emma's parental situation, but not Emma. You can't know what it's like to see your own daughter give up her child. I'm sorry. We could have spent some time speaking about how this affects her, but nah, Emma only mentions her parents once in this movie. And make things much worse with your dad and mom. Because the movie doesn't care about the character who it advertised as its protagonist. No, instead of learning about Emma, Barry decides to trauma dump on Granny. To bad parents and their broken progeny. Although Emma is fine, she's a strong kid. <laughs> oh, I wasn't talking about her. What? You got kicked out too? This is the nicest dress Emma has. She dresses completely fine throughout the whole movie, but this is her best dress, because the movie wants a funny joke, but isn't willing to commit to the actual world and character building that that joke requires. On a similar level, we're supposed to believe that this is the smallest, most insignificant, rundown town in Indiana. The nicest restaurant in town is Applebee's. In the play, there's rundown looking buildings and stores and motels, but now Barry takes Emma dress shopping, and the mall is huge. The school is huge and has an indoor pool. This is a nice hotel, and the characters pretend they're at some rundown Motel 6 when they're clearly not. Is this place? We're all gonna get stabbed and stuffed. You know that, right? We're told that everyone in Indiana is gonna be a fist pumping, Bible thumping, spam eating, cousin humping, cow tipping, shoulder slumping, tea bagging, Jesus jumping, losers with their inbred wives. But then they reach Indiana, and everyone's a gorgeous, flawless-looking Los Angeles citizen. They have the biggest, grandest prom of all time. My prom was in a gym. Me and the boys had a lightsaber fight, and then Principal Jose De Silva took him away. But once we explained to him that we weren't actually fighting, we were just having fun, he joined in on the action. He let me put him in my videos all throughout senior year. He even recreated the song Scream from High School Musical 3. Voices in my head tell me they know best. Got me on the edge, they're pushing, pushing, they're pushing. I made a large banner celebrating that man and carry it around campus every early release Friday. All hail Jose. I miss him. He's still alive and still the principal, I just don't see him anymore. There's a big grand song as everyone gets ready for the prom. The boys get overheated when I strike a pose or two like this. Oh my god, holy shit, bro, I'm overheating right now. You have to hand it to me. I mean, even I would do me. Wouldn't that make you gay? No. This can't be! Miss Green hints that something might be going on. You are gonna have a wonderful prom like a normal girl. I've made sure of that. What is that supposed to mean? Miss Green was a little naughty. She, she was a little stinky. Uh-oh, she made two separate proms. A little loser prom for Emma and a real prom for everyone else. 
Emma sings a sad reprise of the happy getting ready for prom song. How emotional. I watched this movie with my friend Kiana, and she passionately pointed out that everyone at prom is wearing homecoming dresses. I don't know what that means, but I'll take her word for it. A crying Emma calls Alyssa to figure out what's going on. Alyssa knew nothing about this. The entire school kept her in the dark because Stacy and Shelby outed her. They met in secret, the whole town kept this from her? Which is an actual plot hole. All of the students and staff at this school knew not to tell Alyssa because she's lesbian, but none of them told Mrs. Green about this? I'm calling Cap. In the Atlanta play, it was a little odd, a little sussy that Alyssa never found out anything about the change of prom location despite no one specifically keeping it from her. So in the Broadway version, they changed it to be a grand conspiracy against her where no one told her. But that just created a bigger problem than it wanted solved. And the movie maintained that one to one. Emma isn't having it. Come meet me. I can't. Look, my mother's here. We'll leave her. Tell her you're gay! I laughed. Kiana and I kept replaying this over and over. We're sorry. Tell her you're gay! <laughs> and the play is delivered perfectly fine. Then tell her you're gay! Tell her we're in love! That's the plan, right? Then tell her you're gay! Tell her we're in love! That was the plan, right? But it's so over the top here. It is such a Netflix original moment. Tell her you're gay! Dee Dee accidentally lets slip that they only came here for positive PR, and Principal Skinner is disgusted. This right here is the character's lowest point in the story, where everyone separates and is dejected. Normally, it happens about two-thirds or three-fourths of the way through a story, so that the characters can pick themselves back up in the final stretch. In the prom, that's the halfway point of the musical, almost the halfway point of the movie, which means what would normally be the last 30 minutes in a traditional narrative is stretched to an hour plus in the prom. In the play, it was definitely subversive. Normally, Act 1 ends with a big number with the characters at peak optimism, about to be knocked down in Act 2, or dealing with a decent-sized setback that they'll overcome shortly into Act 2 before falling into their pit later. The prom did something different, but I think there's a reason that's not traditionally done. Because it leaves it with a very awkward pace, and the second half of the movie slash play drags. The next day, Miss Green holds a press conference and lies to justify the situation. In the play, she calls the Broadway stars out on their behavior here. Those individuals who came into our community uninvited and proceeded to exploit this girl. Those are the people you should be writing about. Give them the publicity they so desperately crave. Privileged people from New York who know nothing about us came down here just to get publicity. When they are the villains, you should be writing about them. But that part's cut from the movie because it's fully lost track of any elements of satire regarding these actors at this point. We're supposed to completely accept them as the protagonists and love them now. Emma is heartbroken. Angie is just chilling in her bed with her and Emma's like, Angie, you're my best friend. You've been a good friend. I have. You have. They exchanged a singular sentence before this. All of the Broadway stars arrive at Emma's house. A bus pulls up directly outside. When watching the movie, Kiana and I question if Granny is just letting all of these people in the house now, but in the play, that's an actual line. So what, Grandma just lets you in now? Oh yeah, we're besties. Yet another layer of self-awareness removed from the hit smash hit film, The Prom on Netflix. Barry insists that they need to get Emma on TV, but Emma just says she wants to be done with it. She doesn't have the strength to tell her story right now. You gotta get that girl on TV. Okay, great. No, not great. I'm sorry, but there is no way I'm getting in front of a camera and telling my story to millions of people. I can't do that. Say. Please, please just go. And the Broadway stars say, oh no, that's not gonna fly. And Angie says, go, go guys, I got this, I'll convince her. Okay. I got this, I know what I'm doing. Let me do my thing. So then Angie starts eating out of Emma's ice cream with her fingers, which is a sign of friendship. She tells Emma that she's gotta stand up for those who don't get the spotlight. You gotta do this. You gotta do it for all of us people that are standing in the wings waiting to go on. 
because Angie doesn't get the spotlight because she was passed up for the protagonist earlier. So they're continuing to manipulate Emma. Emma said very clearly she doesn't want this, but Angie decides to change Emma's mind with a musical number. Emma makes some cringe-ass facial expressions here, and I felt embarrassed on behalf of the actress. And I look like this. And at this point, it's like, Angie, who are you? Who it? Who is this? Who is this person? Who are you? Who are you? Who is this? Boosting Emma's spirits right here is the only thing she does of note in this entire show. This easily could have been Barry, Dee Dee, or even Trent if you want to get wacky. Bertram hasn't done anything, have him do the Zazz number. There is absolutely no reason for the character of Angie to even be in this movie at all, and that's completely true for the stage production too, which is odd because normally shows condense their casts as much as possible. That's why there's constant doubling up of roles between acts. It's very weird to see an irrelevant character make it to the final product. Give it some zazz. We then cut to Barry and Dee Dee in their hotel room. Another scene not in the play at all. They are sad losers. Barry tries to convince Dee Dee to call her ex-husband and get Emma a spot on his talk show, but she refuses to talk to him. She tells him to call his parents who kicked him out, but he correctly tells her that he doesn't owe them anything. I'm not the one who should have regrets. I was the kid. I was the kid. I was 60. I don't think this scene was awful. Pretty classic Oscar bait. It got the nomination, and I think Barry's right. And then his arc is that he decides to reconcile with his mom anyway. So okay. Dee Dee realizes she's in love with Principal Skinner, and Barry goes her to go for it and apologize to him. And then this happens. Barry. Oh. <laughs> I, love I love you! you. I, love I love you! If you're considering buying a ticket to this show, do yourself a favor. Buy a few feet of good heavy rope instead, and then go hang yourself. What the hell? We were just dead ass checking out and just kind of skipping forward on the timeline, and we were jump scared by this frame out of context and screamed. And we play it, and we, we watched it play out, and our minds broke. What the fuck is this? In what world is this a moment of platonic friendship? Me and all my homies love scissoring each other. I suppose at this point, we need to address a major elephant in the room with this film. James Corden playing a flamboyant homosexual man. Back when I was growing up, gay people were just starting to slither their way into prominent roles in movies, but they were still just stereotypes and not much else. I thought you said friend. Chuck is just a friend. Oh, okay. You bitch! <laughs> Chuck, wait! James Gordon's performance is that. You can count on Uncle Barry. He can turn this bushy duck into a swan. I am as gay as a bucket of wigs. A bucket of them! But old Barry's done some flirting. Try to bat your eyes. Smiles each time you grin. Now currently, I am not speaking on behalf of the Legitimacua Plus organization. They're more than capable of doing it themselves. I'm speaking for myself as a gay positive icon. If you have any doubts that I'm qualified, I'm gonna ease them right now. During my prom, I took gay positive photos with my guy bestie who, believe it or not, was also named Kian. I don't think I even printed the actual pictures with the girl who was my prom date, who was actually the sister of the girl I had romantic moments with in the band closet. Fun fact. Anyways, I'm getting really off topic. I hope it's clear that the point I'm trying to make with all this is that if I were to become gay later, I would not be homophobic. So you can trust my opinion here. As someone with a large, wide roster of gay friends, Barry is literally nothing like any of them. First of all, during his super gay moments, he speaks with a western accent for some reason. Of course. 
course I will go with you. <laughs> okay, people, it's Mickey and Judy time, okay? What are you gonna wear? None of my gay friends sound like they're from the rural south during moments of high passion, but maybe that's just a very specific character choice. I'd say like every gay person I know has one or two gay stereotypes that are true for them. Barry has all of them just dumped into him. He loves makeup and tiaras. You can borrow all my makeup, baby, I'll wear a tiara when it's go time. He calls himself Miss Glickman. Allow Miss Glickman to demonstrate. But he's not trans, he's just gay. James Corden's performance here doesn't seem authentic to any gay person I can think of, except for Nakato Avocado. I was the kid. I was the kid. I was 60. I did a video in the car eating that in and out. It was intense. It was emotional. It was big. Barry's Broadway actor, a gay man, sang these for years and he was quite fine with all of it, so maybe I'm just wacky and silly. I'm probably not an expert on all of this, seeing as I thought the T came before the B and the acronym up until last month. I had been saying it wrong the whole time and no one ever corrected me and I felt very silly. I won't spend too long on this because every gay man with an internet connection blasted James Corden's ass into the shadow zone when this movie dropped. Barry Glickman's FDR might just be the most insultingly misguided, offensive, and laughable performance that this reviewer has ever had the squirming misfortune to endure. I can no longer tolerate this! Why cast James Corden? Why not get the original person who played him on Broadway? He knows the lines. I guess their reasoning was that they wanted the Broadway stars to be played by famous actors, but if that's the case, why didn't they cast famous people to play these two? The most famous actor in this movie, Keegan-Michael Key, plays the small town principal, so they really didn't commit to the casting if that was their idea. Emma and Alyssa's performances are believable. I still prefer the stage actors, but I do see elements of every girl in my life who's uncloseted themselves within these two characters, despite there not being much depth. And the reason is that these are actually legitimate actresses. According to the movie's director, a gay man, it was super important to get authentic portrayals of Emma and Alyssa. But then the main character didn't matter. Did the studio heads force Corden into this? And then the Hollywood elite at the Golden Globes nominated him for a Golden Globe for his role, but didn't acknowledge Emma and Alyssa's actresses at all? It just feels like the financiers and the shadowy executives up the chain did not care about genuine representation at all. And then director Ryan Murphy tried to insert as much authenticity wherever he could, but it wasn't enough. Plot. Plot. The plot. Plot. It's back. Dee Dee arrives at Principal Skinner's office. I just thought you might want to take me to dinner and worship me again. <laughs> No, I would not like to do that. Okay, what's going on here? Why is everybody always so mad at me? Well, speaking for myself, it's because you're an opportunist. You came here for publicity. You're a terrible person. No, no, nobody gets to talk to me that way. Nobody. He talks about how he loved one of her performances as a flawed woman who was determined to be better. It inspired him. And then she performs that song for him. In the play, there's a silly quick change that naturally isn't in the movie because it's not really magical when it's not live in front of you. Principal Skinner is like, Okay, Dee Dee, I love you again. This is such a terrible relationship. And it's like this in the musical too. Although they're pretty much the same age there. Like, there was a YouTuber called Carson who did this to like a 17-year-old fan and Twitter obliterated him for all eternity. But imagine how much worse it would be if he were an actual Broadway celebrity and the girl was 22 years younger than him instead of two years younger. Dee Dee, not charging for an apology is not a selfless act. What the hell? And all joking aside, they're both like completely elderly. They'll die of Parkinson's any day now. The age difference isn't really the issue. The issue is he is obsessed with her and she is using that. Idol worship exists no matter what age you are. I live in a small town full of small people and if Lady Gaga showed up and was like, I'm gonna date you in exchange for your land, all of the adults in town would date her and she'd get all of the land. They'd be starstruck. Lady Gaga's most likely not gonna do that to the town I live in, but I'm just saying it could happen. I think you get the, I hope you get the point, I guess. If you want people to like you instead of hate you, you have to put other people's interests before your own. You don't understand. I am a celebrity. 
It is all about me. It has been for decades. <laughs> He's literally teaching her how to show baseline human decency. You gotta figure that out before a relationship, man. I hate I can fix him relationships. Like, girl, you can't. You can't fix him. Dump his ass. You're not Bob the Builder. After getting her spirits boosted in her previous scene, Emma forgot about that scene and she's sad and mad again making me question why that was even in the movie slash play. She's angry at Alyssa for prioritizing her mother over her and decides that she can't do this anymore. She breaks up with Alyssa. Alyssa finally gets a song almost an hour and a half into the movie about how her mother's controlled her her entire life. And we finally get a little bit of insight into who she is. Cause mom's convinced if you're perfect, your father might come back. They tell and don't show, but I guess I'll take their word for it. And the big emotional moment of the song is this. You're not yourself. You're not what she wants. You're someone in between. Listening to the soundtrack out of context before the movie, I was like, oh my god, bro, that's emotional. But after watching the movie, it's like, who do you want to be, Alyssa? We know what your mom wants you to be. The movie makes that clear, but who are you who are you outside of wanting to be publicly out we don't know anything about your desires or anything substantial about your personality they cast these authentic lgbq teens who portray the characters extremely believably but then don't give them anything to do and don't give them anything to work with to make them interesting Trent arrives at the mall to talk to Stacy, Shelby, Nick, and Kevin. We don't have a drama program. That explains your general lack of empathy. I'm not sure how he knows who they are, or how he knew where to find them, or why he's a character in this movie, but he sings a genuinely hilarious song about how you can't pick and choose which rules in the Bible to follow. Kaylee has a small tattoo. Kaylee, guess what waits for you? What? An eternity and the Pits of hell. As my stepdad always says. Oh, stepdad. In the play, he's just going to speak to the town's youth in general, and they just happen to be here. But in the movie, he just walks up to their cafeteria table, and I assumed he was just tracking them down specifically. It did not translate. His song is so good that it completely cures all of their homophobia. And now they love Emma. Awesome work, Trent. I grew up surrounded by hypocrisianity. Everyone at church broke the Ten Commandments left and right, except for the murdered one, probably, hopefully, but they still loved themselves. But when someone was gay, oh, sinner! The Bible says you can't shave, you can't get tattoos, you can't get divorced. And they always justified that by saying like, oh, oh, well, the New Testament retcons the Old Testament because you don't have to murder animals for forgiveness anymore. Therefore, some other things probably changed and now we can shave. But the six lines of the Bible that vaguely mention homo six, six <laughs> that was an accident. The six lines of the Bible that vaguely mention homosexuality, big uh-oh. Anyways, very silly song, sung very well, but it feels very bizarre and out of place with the pacing of the story. Let's hope you don't masturbate, cause the scripture says we'll have to cut off your hands. This is immediately after the breakup. Things are just happening at this point without cause and effect, which is the trap that a lot of musicals fall into, but this is just kind of ridiculous. Back at the hotel lobby, where everyone apparently hangs out in their free time, Dee Dee reveals that she offered to give her husband her expensive house in the Hamptons. <gasps> There's a spider. I'm just gonna... I'm gonna leave it alone. I'm scared. Dee Dee reveals that she offered to give her husband her expensive house in the Hamptons in exchange for giving Emma a spot on his talk show. I'm gonna take a stand. And I want to thank you all because without your love and support, I never would have found the courage. But, um... <sighs> The reason I came was to tell you that I'm going to do it my way. Dee Dee then tries to kill Emma. You owe me a house! Oh my god! Oh I'm so sorry! God. You owe me a house! I'm so sorry! I'm so sorry! She owes me a house! Dee Dee! She owes me a house! She's a very passionate woman. Emma deems that they will be having a prom and asks James Corden to be her prom date. He sings a song about how he'll finally get to go to prom. When he was a kid, he waited outside the prom for his crush to arrive, but sadly saw him arrive with a girl. 
very epic that they casted 26 year olds to play the high schoolers in the modern storyline and 12 year olds to play high schoolers in the flashback storyline. Barry's very happy. He looks at his younger self with what I can only describe as sexual lust. What do you think James Corden smells like? Like, I feel like mentally I can smell him and it's like graham crackers and sweat. Emma live streams as she sings a song in her bed and puts it on the internet. Is she a YouTuber? It gets 8 million views, so it's very lucky that this went into any sort of algorithm and anyone saw it, but honestly, good for her, pop off. A ton of gay teens across the globe watch it and make the goofiest facial expressions of all time. And then they rip off Dear Evan Hansen. Remember Dear Evan Hansen? Watching that movie in a theater was the best experience of my life. Everyone groaned when the song started. Everyone laughed at Ben Platt's performance. A group of complete strangers decided to be bullies at the same time at the same night and it was incredible. There's a part where Evan's speech goes viral and touches people's hearts all over the globe. His best friend died. You won't believe what he did next. The exact same thing happens here. I was genuinely shocked at how shamelessly they ripped off Dear Evan Hansen. It's insane. Share it with the people you love. Repost. The world needs to hear this. Hi, Emma. I loved your video. Where do I start? I think my parents always knew. I felt so alone. Beautiful tribute. I know someone who really needed to hear this today. Nothing made sense until him. She's the best thing in my life. The only good thing. But we're always hiding. It seems like in the second act, they just didn't know what to do after the fake prom. You see, all of this is based off a real life incident. In 2010, a girl wanted to bring her girlfriend to the prom in Fulton, Mississippi, but the school board canceled the whole thing instead. Parents then got together and held a separate prom, intentionally keeping the location a secret from Constance. Then, out of obligation, they threw together a loser prom that only had seven students attend. I'm reading this from Wikipedia. So it has to be true. <laughs> So the writers of the prom just copied and pasted all of that. Boom, there's act one. What do we do for act two? Uh... Oh shit, what are we gonna do now? Maybe we have a number here. Uh, maybe we have Trent sing a song to the town's youth. Uh, maybe we have Emma inspire teens all over the state to come out. It all just feels completely random. After inspiring everyone in Indiana to come out publicly, there's now a billion gay people with no prom to house them. And there's only one thing left to do. Build a prom for everyone. Show them all it can be done. If music blares and no one cares who your unruly heart loves. Those are the lyrics. I just sang them. Dee Dee decides to finance the prom with her credit card. That's her character arc. She gave away some money. Please, please, no. I already gave a house. But first, she reveals that she called Barry's mom, who flew to Indiana and is now in the school. I know you couldn't do it on your own. What did she say? Well, I think maybe you should let her tell you that. Hi, Barry. No. This isn't in the musical at all. They solely added this so that James Corden could have more to do. She loves Barry, but... His dad isn't ready to love him yet. She's like, we didn't kick you out, son. You left first. Oh, we love you. We just don't accept you. Imagine kicking this poor precious kid out of your house. This poor guy. Barry's mom is a monster, but she's like, Barry, I love you. And she helps set up the prom. The play, meanwhile, had the strained parent-child relationship scene be between Alyssa and Miss Green, because they actually matter in the play. Let's talk about what's really going on here. We can't keep avoiding this just because it's uncomfortable. I love you, and the stupid thing is- Alyssa! I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but you just don't understand. This is not who you really are. Whatever, whatever you are feeling right now is because of those people. They're putting these ideas in your head, and they're turning me into someone I don't want to be, and I am, I am sick of all this. Come on, we're going to end this now. No, I'm not going with you. I don't want to be a part of any of your shit anymore. <laughs> 
once again, seems like an important scene to have if you care about Alyssa's story, but the movie does not. Overall, most movie musical adaptations have far more cutscenes and shuffled orders than The Prom does. It's mostly intact, but all of The Prom's cut sequences are of Emma and Alyssa, and it's so weird. The Broadway stars confess that they only came here for good PR, but Emma says that they've done so much good that she doesn't even care that they used and manipulated her. You bought me a house! Oh my god! Oh I'm so sorry! You me a house! The Bully Squad comes to set up all their homophobia gone because of that banger song. Miss Green arrives to stop it. There's another great scene in the play where she insists that she is doing this for the community and the kids in this town. But then Trent speaks to all the kids who he just sang a song to and says, Is this really what you want? And they all say, like, Miss Green, we think it's okay. Our homophobia is gone because we sang a song for four minutes. But that's not in the movie, so there's no payoff to anything Trent did in the story. Alyssa shows up, inspired by Emma's speech, and comes out publicly to claim Emma as her lover. I love you, Emma Nolan. Oh my god. Oh. Miss Green leaves in shock, struggling to accept it. So long, gay Bowser! In the play, this is her final scene. We will talk tonight. Okay. Okay. So long, gay Bowser! She agrees to leave when Barry tells her this. If you don't let her be who she is, you're going to lose her. You are going to lose your beautiful daughter. Trust me. It's treated as the climax of the show. From Barry's perspective, that's a wonderful closure. His family didn't accept him for who he is, he doesn't owe them anything. In the hotel, he's right. In the original play, he's right. But that movie had to screw everything up by plunging him back into this turbulent relationship with parents who still won't fully accept it. Normally, the climax of something hinges on the main character making a big, dramatic choice. Here it's Alyssa, who's the side character, which is another weird structural thing. Barry gets a moment too, and I guess the story thinks of him as the protagonist. Emma has nothing to do with this climax. She doesn't really make any big choices throughout the whole story. She's a very passive character, dragged by everyone around her from set piece to set piece to set piece, with a smile on her face. The fact that they get back together immediately makes me wonder what the point of them breaking up in the first place was. There's no scenes where they contemplate the breakup and are heartbroken. Emma breaks up with her partner of a year and a half and then is immediately like, oh hi Broadway people, with no signs of sadness. Really, the biggest narrative impact of the breakup is it serving as a vehicle for Barry to get invited to the prom and get that closure. But I don't think he needed to specifically be someone's prom date to get that closure. He would have been attending the prom anyway. The whole breakup could have been cut. There's probably like 50 minutes worth of actual stuff that happens in this two hour story and you could slice out everything else. Cut out the monster truck rally. Cut out the spirit boosting number that's never acknowledged again. The story, from its inception all the way to the film version, has one of the most awkward, janky narratives I've seen in anything. Oh my. Are you kidding me? <laughs> this is amazing. You guys put the prom together. Why are you surprised by what it looks like? But then the song of all time happens. It's such a musically satisfying number and it makes me forget how terrible this whole movie has been. It's a genuine travesty that these numbers got shoved in this movie. They're so good, they're so pretty and beautiful, and this story's a mess. Everyone gets closure to the character arcs. Trent gets hired as the drama teacher despite having no teaching credentials. You should be like a teacher. Oh, you should be our drama teacher. Yes, please. Yeah. No, you okay. should do it. Do it. <laughs> You're hired. I'm a teacher. That was more impactful when he had a connection with the whole youth of the town rather than just four students in this movie. Principal Skinner did not hire him on the spot in the stage show because that's stupid. In the play, he just implies he's interested and might go for that. Angie gets casted as the lead in Chicago because the other actress contracted shingles. I just got the call! Tina Louise shingles! What'd you tell him? I said, no way, I got a prom to go to. Atta girl! Ah, just kidding, I'm on the red eye tomorrow! 
Now you see, in the Atlanta version, this was all that exchange was. I just got the call. Tina Louise has shingles. The producers asked me to go on as Roxy Hart. Why did you tell them? I said I have a prom to go to. Fuck off. <laughs> but then the Broadway show added her saying, Psych! Which I'm not a fan of, because she had such a simple arc before. She realized there are more important things than Broadway fame. That was all of their arcs, pretty much, but with all these silly wackadoodle changes made by Broadway in the movie, none of them really have that story anymore, because they're given to other subplots. Barry gets to dance with his mom and gets to be prom queen. Dee Dee gets to dance with Principal Skinner. They kiss and are in love. Who wants to go drink expired apple juice and then kiss each other? Don't let me destroy them. I'll try my best. Don't date him, you're a predator! I noticed on my second watch that in the background, Bertram is holding hands with Emma's grandma. I'm not sure what's happening there, but I'm really happy for them. I hope it turns out well. Billions of gays pour into the gym, and even the icky sachets show up to admire everyone. Dee Dee runs up and grabs a random teenager's breasts. I'm like, no, hold on, watch that again. It's Dee Dee, you don't know them! Then she grabs Alyssa by the waist. Once again, they've never interacted before. Then the movie inserts a little more of its feisty personality when Miss Green returns. A new scene. The entire crowd turns to watch as Miss Green says she loves her daughter so much she's no longer homophobic at all and is here to support the prom because she loves her daughter. Which means that if Alyssa came out in the beginning, then this whole prom issue wouldn't have happened. I guess she didn't know that, so that's not her fault. Everyone cheers and is super happy. That's so fake and stupid. The original ending was so real. It was so much better. I've never heard of a homophobic person over age 30 becoming unhomophobic. They just don't make homophobic people that way. And on the same note, I've never heard of a homophobic person being attractive looking. I've never seen one. It's not part of God's plan for homophobic people. The movie doesn't give any realistic situation to latch onto. They'll just longingly wish for their lives to be like the movie, which it most likely never will be. Oh my god, this song's so good! Build a prom for everyone. Show them all it can be done. If music blares and no one cares, who your unruly heart loves is not as good as High School Musical, but nothing is and nothing ever will be. They should have stopped making movies after High School Musical 3 because nothing will ever reach those heights again. Look at Granny jamming out in the background of a high school prom. Even Bertram's happy. Miss Green is partying. Homophobia conversion therapy does wonders. Chicka, chicka, chew, wop. Meaningless lyrics done? How's the catchy tune coming along? Excellent! We'll be done by lunch! You know how I spent a lot of this review telling random anecdotal stories about high school that had nothing to do with anything? Notice how I said the Broadway actors' names at the beginning, but didn't say Emma and Alyssa's actors' names until way later? Well, those were all a metaphor, babe! They represented the Broadway actors in this story, because imagine if my random tangents were 65% of the video. It'd be weird, right? I just metaphored you. Get metaphored, bitch! Alyssa and Emma finally embrace and kiss, with Trent awkwardly framed right behind them, his head poking up above their foreheads. During the credits, the characters hold up most likely signs, and they feel like they're randomly generated. They have nothing to do with these characters. Barry gets most athletic. Granny will do anything for a retweet. Shout out to Bertram for being happiest. And, I don't wanna let them down, down, down. and then Alyssa gets most artistic. What? That's not an aspect of her character. She's in a bunch of clubs and extracurriculars. Like, that's so weird. Most artistic? They also show the cast in descending order, from most important to least important. Emma and Alyssa go 6th and 7th, because the movie hates them. It's Emma's story, damn it!
What a train wreck, bro. Awful people got to be awful with no repercussions, and the movie treated them like heroes. A movie about gay representation completely shafted the gay characters in favor of having James Corden offend all of Twitter.com. Characters dealing with internalized homophobia get quick and easy conclusions. Eliza, who's afraid to come out due to needing her mother's acceptance, quickly and immediately gets her mother's acceptance. The parts of the show that have actual emotional weight are brushed over and given no focus in favor of shallow, heartless light shows. I will never be the same person. The prom is not a movie. The prom is an experience. I don't want to start a riot. I don't want to blaze a trail. I don't want to be a scapegoat for people to oppose. What I want is simple, as far as wanting goes. This right here is what the movie should have been about. Gay people aren't trying to be pariahs and social disruptors. They aren't trying to turn the whole world gay by planting subliminal messages like a purple Teletubby with a satchel. Like my parents told me they are growing up, putting the phobia and homophobia just for fun, I guess. The only people trying to forcefully change other people's sexualities are gay negative icons like Mrs. Green. They just want to be in love. I've never seen a movie like this where it's so obvious who the protagonists should be and yet they just aren't the protagonists. Hell is supposed to be your worst fears haunting you for all eternity, which implies that my parents' souls will be perpetually watching RuPaul's Drag Race once they arrive. I'll be in the next room over, watching the Netflix original film, The Prom, directed by Ryan Murphy. If they don't watch my videos, they won't know I said this publicly. <laughs> I'm so mischievous, bro, I'm so sneaky. <laughs> this movie could have done so much more. The Prom stage show isn't awful, it's fun fluff with a heartfelt message buried within the unfocused story. Catchy songs. The movie amplifies everything that doesn't work and removes everything that does. It's eye candy and nothing more. Just listen to the banger ass soundtrack and skip the movie. Go play the Lego Mars Mission online game for two hours instead. I have it localized on my computer. I think that the Ariana Grande song, Into You, stole its backing vocals from the Mars Mission game. Watch this, watch this, listen to this. Do you think she stole it? Let me know what you think. Be sure to rate the video and leave your thoughts. Tell her you're gay! You're fucking gay!